Hi, and welcome to Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics, where meaning is always context-driven. My name is John Strazisich, and uh, I am the host of this site, um, and thank you for joining me today. Um, and what I mean by biblical theology, uh, number one, is that we're this site will be dealing with um, both the Old and New Testaments, um, not just one, and and then in a little more of a different, uh, slight use of the term biblical theology, when we do create theology, um, it is best for your building blocks to uh, begin with, let's say, Johannine theology and then move on to Pauline theology, and then Petrine theology, and that you build your theology understanding um, the authors uh, uh, that would th that would contribute to any particular theology that you're trying to build. Um, and likewise, with the, it, would work, it would work the same way in the Old Testament with either Isaianic uh, theology, Jeremianic theology, Pentateuchal theology, uh, and so forth. Um, and so, and the moniker is meaning is always context driven. So, meaning is going to be derivative of the specific uh, passage itself. So, if you're doing, you know, um, a, a word study or something, it, it the, the, the meaning of that particular word will be determined by the context in which it is situated. So that's the moniker for this particular um, channel. Uh, welcome to it. Um, and for the, the, I guess you got to start somewhere, and um, I'm always unorthodox in my approach typically, and I'm going to be uh, approaching, uh, I guess, this, this particular um, this board here uh, with an introduction to Hebrew poetry and it's important because basically one-third of the Hebrew Bible or the size of your New Testament if you were to take that that's how much poetry is um, in the Old Testament it's it's the size of the New Testament canon so um, there's a lot of uh, it's, a, it's a lot of it's a lot of work it covers you know basically the prophets and obviously, you know, Psalms and um, Job, Proverbs, and and there's lots of uh, of poetry embedded within the Pentateuch, um, uh, tons of it. Um, so um, we'll be we'll be looking at these things, and it, in in doctrinally, it's very important too to understand that poetry has to be inspired speech. And um, you have to be able to make doctrine from it. Although you have to be able to correctly uh, interpret doctrine, whether you know it, it's being composed on the back of simile or metaphor. Um, but you have the same that same problem when you approach you know the New Testament, such as Jesus saying, "I am the door." So it, it, it you know, but but it does it it doesn't that doesn't stop New Testament scholars from theologizing about that. Um, but <clears throat> so it's the same, the same, the same, uh, interpretive nature needs to, needs to take place when you, when you come to, um, uh, poetic work. Um, and I guess it's, remember, remember it's meanings always context driven. So whatever particular poetic text you're looking at, it, it's going to have to be, um, the meaning's going to have to be derived from from that specific um, genre um, uh, from which you know if it's a particular psalm, what type of genre is that does this psalm pertain to? And so you you generate meaning from there. Um, it's pretty basic. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, my name's John Strazizich. I'm married. Um, I spent some years teaching down in the South Pacific and at Bethesda University. Um, and uh, so I, my, my dissertation was published um, by Brill um, on the Book of Joel. It's basically, it's a work on intertextuality. Um, 
So a little bit about myself. Um, and as far as my theology, um, I'll let the board speak for itself, but I tend to be uh, somewhat eclectic, um, like most scholars. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'm, I'll be fair to the text and, um, and we'll let uh, meaning always be driven by the context. All right, so come, coming to uh, Hebrew poetry, um, I guess what I'd like to do, we'll start with uh, Robert Loth. Um, he's typically called the father of Hebrew poetry. And um, basically with him, the modern study of, of biblical poetics begins. Um, I have a bunch of slides that we could look at that, 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 that go back prior to this. Um, but I think for uh, for our purposes, we can we can begin with the bishop, um, and he says this. He says the correspondence of one verse or line with another, I call parallelism. When a proposition is delivered, and a second is subjoined to it, or drawn under it, equivalent or contrasted with it, in sense or similar to it in the form of grammatical construction, these I call parallel lines, or the Latin phrase parallelismus membrorum. And the words or phrases answering one to another in the corresponding lines parallel terms. Parallelism may be reduced to three sorts. Parallels synonymous, parallels antithetic and parallels synthetic um, and it's very important for you to note what, what he calls parallelis, parallelismus membrorum it would wouldn't would uh, that that covers the entire um, uh, the gamut of, of his three sorts whether it's synonymous antithetic or synthetic um, and you're going to see that everybody's going to pick up on his terminology, correspondence. Because um, parallelism has a lot to do with the correspondence of one verse or one line with another. So that's very, very important. <clears throat> um, and his phrase here, when a proposition is delivered and a second is subjoined to it, drawn under it, equivalent or contrasted with it in sense, or similar to it in the form of grammatical instruction. That last phrase is synthetic parallelism, according to the bishop. Um, and uh, and th this has served for 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 uh, I, you know for for centuries here. And um, some people like to throw the bishop under the bus, but um, this board will not do that. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> you know people want to are, aren't uh, you know they, they want to advance his thoughts um, but he came up with with he he just used these three terms synonymous antithetic and synthetic um, and in one way they can work but um, most everybody has a problem with his synthetic um, but they just come up with a different name uh, virtually meaning the same thing so um, but they just they just don't like uh, his terminology, which is fine. Um, it's fine to to search for something different. But these three th parts of uh, of parallelism it, using his uh, 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 I guess definitions uh, work. But it is it does not um, incorporate everything about. Hebrew poetry he's he, he's really uncovering a lot um, about Hebrew poetry and by and it, 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 for him this was groundbreaking at the time remember this was what what 1753 so his uh, his his analysis was was revolutionary um, and has uh, affected us to this day moving along um, so looking at at how he would use these uh, these terms uh, looking at synonymous parallelism we can look if we go to like Psalm 19 1 um, Hashemayim 
uh, misaparim kevod el umaase yadav magid harakia. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament declares the works of His hands. Um, so you can see how synonym. This is he, this is synonymous parallelism. You you have um, in line A, the heavens are are reporting or they're telling of the glory of God, but in line B, you have the firmament making known the works of His hands. So you can see that the ideas are are very very similar, and this is what he calls synonymous parallelism. Um, and uh so so very very important and you could you can you can virtually go anywhere and see uh synonymous or semantic parallelism occurring uh again and again and again and again um and it is a core part of of hebrew poetry but it does definitely does not explain everything and we'll get into that today uh, moving on to antithetical parallelism. Uh, if we go to Proverbs 10, there's a lot of antithetical uh, um, parallelism going on there in this particular chapter of Proverbs. And we have here, Bain Chacham Yisamak Av Uven Kisil Tugat Imo. So you definitely do not want to be a Tugat Imo, a grief uh, to one's mother. Um, so here it says that a wise son makes the father glad, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. So you can see here we have um, what he calls um, antithetical parallelism, not confined to any particular form, for sentiments are opposed to sentiments, words to words, singulars to singulars, plurals to plural. So he's just, he's talking here about, you know, we've got a, a, a line A, you got the wise son making glad the father, and then the opposite is a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Um, so the moral of that story is you do not want to be a two-got emo. All right. And then uh, coming down here to synthetic parallelism that got the bishop in a lot of hot water, um, these are what he says, sentences uh, which answer to each other, not by iteration of the same image or sentiment or the opposition of their contraries, as in the case above, but merely by the form of construction. So what he's saying here, the form of construction, you've got a line, and here I have installed my king, or va'ani uh, nasakti malki, and, and, and you have you have the atnok there um, under Malki, um, which is a pause, and then we have the the re, the remainder of the um, of 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 his lineation, um, all Zion Har Kodchi. So I have installed literally. I have poured out, um, but 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 here we have to take the meaning as I have installed um, or I have um, appointed. Um, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Um, so here what we have is, if you look here, va'ani nasakti malki, we've got three words in line A, and I have installed my king and then it's followed by Altzion Har Kochi, uh, which could either be t be taken as a as two words. It's connected by Makhev, so I guess we're going to follow the the Masoretes here. So this is a three-two construction, um, and and t and this is somewhat typical uh, of Hebrew poetry, where they're going to have three words on line A and three Hebrew words in line B, or you can have a 2-2, two, two, a 4-4, four, four, uh, a 3-2. Um, there's lots of variations, but 
they're all they're all very very uh um there's a di discreet amount of words or a terse amount of words that are going to go upon either line a or b and it typically will be anywhere from two to four words that's the standard anything beyond that's beginning to stretch um and sometimes it is evangelistically stretched in poetry at times but but most of the time when we re read hebrew poetry it's two to four words other people would like to cut that down to two to three um we'll see that a little bit later but um but this is, uh, I guess, the, the the three typical forms that the bishop has has presented to the world in his groundbreaking uh, work, um, especially on his commentary on Isaiah, and he also was the one who popularized that that Hebrew poetry. It it it, it should incorporate the Hebrew prophets. So that's why he had this commentary on Isaiah, because you, as you begin to see and look at the prophetic literature, a lot of, it's a lot of it's written. I mean, the whole book of Isaiah is, is essentially um, is written in poetry. I mean, you got what chapter twenty? It's it's a little bit of bio, uh, bio and also what thirty six, thirty seven, uh, thirty eight, somewhere in there. You got some narrative portions pulled out of kings um but virtually everything else in the whole book is, is is written in poetry just open it up i mean look at isaiah 53 it's all it's all written all in poetry whole book um and uh, so he popularized the notion that that poetry extends way beyond the poetical books uh, of the hebrew canon now moving along along um it's good we need to look seriously at George Buchanan Gray. He uh he 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 did he 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 liked his predecessor um Robert Loth and but but he what he was doing he was he was attempting to move beyond uh Loth in in finding something behind the screen uh so to speak. He was driven behind parallelism to find some uh, fundamental operating principles uh, of which he did find um, and it may not tell the whole story but he has definitely added to the overall picture his book is excellent and should be used even though it's dated it should be used in, in schools um, so in his attempt he says this the study of parallelism must lead if I have so far observed and interpreted correctly to the conclusion that parallelism is but one law or form of Hebrew poetry and that it leaves much to be explained by some other law or form. We are thus driven back behind parallelism in search of an independent rhythmic principle in Hebrew poetry, which will account for the presence of balance or other rhythmical relation as between two lines in which the parallelism is not such as necessarily to involve this balance or other rhythmical relation. So what he's basically just saying is that um, in his study he has found that that you know not every single die stick or or tri stick is 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 related or it should be should be should have semantic uh relationships such as you know parallelism uh, of of words or phrases or terms semantics and so um so he's saying that especially when we come to this aspect of what the bishop called synthetic parallelism he want he he saw that there's there's some other principle that's that's very very important and that's what he's trying to 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 get at um, and he's pointing this out and he does so very well so moving on here he uh, um, on page 126 he says parallelism both associates and disassociates it associates two lines by the correspondence of ideas remember correspondence going back to the bishop everyone picks up on this term uh, 
correspondence of ideas which it implies, it disassoci disassociates them by the differentiation of the terms by means of which the corresponding ideas are expressed, as well as by the fact that one parallel line is fundamentally a repetition of the other. The effect of disassociation is a constant occurrence of breaks or pauses, or rather a constant recurrence of two different types of breaks or pauses. One, the break between two parallel and corresponding lines, and two, the greater break at the end of the second line before the thought is resumed and carried forward uh, in another combination of parallel lines. So what he's talking about is let's just look at a die stick, two lines. So you're going to have a line and then it's going to have like two slash forwards um, um, and then another line. So this slash or a kasura, it's a break, it's a pause. Um, and so when you when Hebrew poetry is read, it's read rhythmically um, or uh, prosodically and that, that there's some type of intonation and rhythm because it's poetic and so it's going to have some type of beat um, and and it's you're going to have a natural pause um, and then a greater break at w when the die stick is completed so this is what he's referring to so what he's saying is that he is discerning that behind parallelism there is the fundamental importance of lineation. So that is the line. And it's typically in die sticks and tri sticks. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see that there, there are mono colons uh, or, or hem stitches. Very few, but, but they do occur now and then. Um, but on this particular slide here, he's making... Uh, he's making a, a very important contribution about how um, it, when, when Hebrew poetry is written in lines that there are breaks or pauses and then at the end of the diastic there's a major pause so that's what he's talking about here and he's saying that this is a fundamental formal feature of Hebrew poetry Um, so he, he comes to, to somewhat of a conclusion and he says it seems to me possible and useful to return to parallelistic poetry and to insist one that this consists primarily of die sticks so he's he, he, he's 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 right about this it's uh, uh, it's binary um, and the thoughts are typically uh, they're they're binomial um, there are tri sticks, but but the boatload of them, the the majority of them, is die sticks. So he's looking at 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 some of the fundamental features of poetry. Number one, it consists mainly of die sticks. That's so he's it's a talking about lineation. Uh, two, that these die sticks fall into two broad classes, according as the second line rhythmically balances or echoes the first. So what he means by this, when he says rhythmically balances, he's talking about that we've got three Hebrew words in line A, three Hebrew words in line B, or a 3-2, or a 4-3, or a 4-4, four, four, or whatever the combo is. Um, but, but typically it's it's going to occur like this and there it constantly changes it's never you never have three 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 throughout the whole poem it's that's impossible um and hebrew poetry does not work that way it, it's it's uh, it's a free rhythm um and number three that the lines of these die sticks can also be more accurately classified according to the number of stress words that they contain. So so he's so here he's saying that we primarily got die sticks. The die sticks can either be related uh, 
uh, rhythmically balanced like a 2-2 or echoes that's talking about semantic uh, parallelism or you know like the, the heavens declare the glory of God line A the firmament shows the works of his hand line B so those are parallel uh, words and terms talking about one and the same thing um, you got to go back to Genesis 1 8 on that um, he called the firmament heaven so then you'll be able to understand uh, the parallelism there um, so so now he what he's coming to is he's saying that uh, that accented words stressed words there's uh, basically you know I'm gonna say you know, it's it's a it's a number of stressed words so it, it basically works out to about two to four words per um, uh, per per uh, colon All right uh, moving along here uh, we are going to uh, look at oh Norman Gottfeld and in the interpreter's Bible dictionary he he came up with a very good characteristic for uh, parallelism and he says the fu the fundamental formal feature of canonical poetry is the correspondence of thought in successive half lines known as parallelism of members parallelismus membrorum the thought may be repeated contrasted so repeated means synonymous contrasted means antithetical or advanced it may be figurative stair like or inverted these are other types of uh, um, I, I guess developmental uh, developing a thought so it, it would uh, it, it would it's going to be built it one, one will build upon the other um, and parallelism may be both within lines and between lines this is actually very ingenious and um, this is a classic, uh, um, I guess it's his, his uh, a definition for, for the most prominent form of an operating principle within Hebrew poetry, which would be um, parallelism. Um, and, in, and he remember here, remember he picks up on the word correspondence. Like I told you, the bishop, that's what the bishop said. So he's hes referring to this. So he's basically regurgitating everything the bishop said. And he's adding uh, some, uh, s definitely some, some new information here. Uh, exp especially, he's saying, I I of thought. Correspondence of thought. And I'm going to pick up on that later. And that's a very, very important uh, fundamental feature of poetry. Um, and he says in successive half lines, so it's operating at at, at the half line, um, like line A, um, and so it, it's all happening there. But but uh, but it, it but remember that that's it deal. It's a die stick typically, but the features can be explained by line A. Or by line B, but it's it's operating on the half line. So that's it's important that he uh, delineates that thought, um, and he does us uh, quite a bit of service here. And so I wanted to give him credit um, for his uh, for his work. Very very good. Now moving on here, here um, we're coming to one of the most important scholars. Uh, um, Robert Alter, <clears throat> famous, um, I guess, prof from uh, uh, Berkeley, and uh, and he has written a book, The Art of Biblical Poetry, and all every professor they use his book. Every you can just go online, type in, you know, Hebrew poetry syllabus, and. It, 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 his book is going to be right there. It's going to be, you know, required reading because it's that good. All right. So he has done us huge service. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And so let's look at what he says um, uh, about these successive half, uh, half lines, um, as Norman Gottwald said earlier. He said, the simplest strategy of intensification is the introduction of the second verset. So verset is just a, is, a, is, is a term like line A or line B. It's, it's the individual half lines. Uh, another way to say it is a verset, or it'll be called a colon, um, or a hemstick, or whatever, just or line. Um, you, it's just whether they choose to use English words, Latin words, Greek words as as uh, the basis for their terminology. Let's go back over this again. The simplest strategy of intensification is the introduction of the second verset of one parallel term that is obviously stronger than its counterpart in the first verset. So let's look at uh, a, a, a line here from Psalm 18. For the waves of death washed around me, line A. Now let's look at line B. The torrents of the underworld terrified me. So you've got line A introducing the thought and then he says the simplest strategy of intensification is the introduction of line B. The torrents of the underworld terrified me. So where, whereas the breakers of death merely washed around the speaker of, of colon A, of line A, while the torrents of the underworld terrified uh, David in, in, in line B. So what he's trying to say is that parallelism is a strategy of intensification. So this is a theolo uh, this is a theological statement. You need to be able to look at this. He's trying to tell us that the theological cash is in line B. Okay, or if it's a, you know, if if it's a uh a tri stick. We need to look at the at the whole construction. Is there's going to be a locus of um, of intensified meaning in 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 between the lines. So this is very very important. And so um, and, and virtually this is how this is how the poetry of the Old Testament is written. And people don't have a clue of how to go about interpreting this material. If they just took Robert Alter's strategy of intensification is the introduction of line B, I'm telling you, it's revolutionary. And when you begin to read this, and then you go back to what the bishop said, it's the correspondence of meaning between the lines. Okay, it's very, very important that we go back and you look at what the author is doing with the lines. And how does, how does the second verse set, what does it do? What is its purpose? How is it um, developing or bringing forward or intensifying the thought of line A? So this is what Alter's uh, book uh, um, contains these thoughts very excellent. This is found on page 33. Uh, we're coming to so, some of his contemporary scholars, Adele Berlin, um, and we have Kugel from Harvard, and as I said before, Alter um, is at um, Berkeley. And uh, so Adele Berlin is a, uh, a big, huge scholar. She's made a major contribution to parallelism and she advocates that parallelism is the activation of linguistic equivalences and or contrast within or amongst words, phrases, lines, or entire texts. Um, and so she's looking at her, I think Roman Jacobson, she's using a lot of his um, terminology and uh, ideas uh, about parallelism and she's introducing them to biblical Hebrew, and but but she has made some uh, um, contribution that that parallelism is it, it, it's it, it's 
it's it's an activation of linguistic equivalences far beyond what the bishop envisioned um, um, or or emphasized I should say he did he did he did say he did say that it, it included a lot um, go back and read it the first uh, um, slide on, on on the bishop um, now Kugel is 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 another groundbreaking uh, Jewish scholar um, and these are all uh, Jewish scholars um, uh, here and they're very excellent and 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 worthy of of, of everything uh, you should you should buy all their books um, what Kugel says he argues that parallelism is to be understood conceptually by the binomial parallel structure a what's more b so he's looking at the die stick line a and line b and he's saying line a is introductory what's more is line b so he's also underscoring what alter was saying uh is that the 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 theological cash is going to be typically found in line b now i say typically is that you know maybe 90 percent of the time okay so robert alter emphasizes that parallelism is marked by structures of di sticks tri sticks and quatrains um where there are dynamic movements from one verset to the next which are characterized by focusing heightening concretization intensification or specification so this is what line b is going to do it's going to specify or intensify or concretize line a to something a little more solid where it's going to heighten it focus it um it's you know each line has to be heuristically you, it, and that means it has to be discovered you have to find what the author was doing so it's it this is all uh reader response you have the reader has to really engage himself to find out the hermeneutic of the author um, and it's heuristically found uh, moving on here here uh, we'll look at some more uh, uh, work from uh, Kugel and he says that as parallelism suggests there are quite a few lines in which B is clearly a continuation of A or going beyond A in force of specificity and this it is suggested corresponds to the expectation the ancient Hebrew listener or reader brought to every text his ear was attuned to hearing A is so and what's more B is so that is B was connected to A had something in common with it but was not expected to be nor regarded as mere restatement. Now that is, this is gold. Um, th this uh, Kugel has just, this is absolute gold. Um, and, and, and so this is theologically, this is very important. And I would suggest to you, as, as I suggest the people that are listening to me uh, are going to be typically... Um, teachers or educators uh, within the church that you, uh, you you know incorporate this these ideas uh, to the congregation or to the community um, in such a way that that they will they when they come to the text see we all need to come to the text with our ears attuned in expecting to say okay line a is so what's more b is so we need to have this expectation that the ancient hebrew listener or reader had which they brought to every text and this is what what is missing um and it's just simply uh i don't know i don't know why but it, it's it, it's not being taught um in our congregations and it needs to be uh, 
Okay, so we'll look here at Kugel. Um, he's kind of throwing Harshov under the bus here. Um, but what do you expect when you got a Harvard prof butting heads with a Yale prof? So um, it's a little bit of uh, uh, competition amongst camaraderie. Um, and he says this, the, parallelist, the parallelistic style in the Bible consists not of stringing together clauses that bear some semantic, syntactic, or phonetic resemblance nor yet of saying the same thing twice, but of the sequence A, B, in which B is both a continuation of A and yet broken from it by a pause, a typically emphatic seconding style in which parallelism plays an important part, but whose essence is not parallelism, but the seconding sequence. So he's kind of underscoring a little bit of what Alter was saying earlier that it, the line B is a uh, it's a strategy for intensification or specification. Um, line A is introductory. Line B is then going to be it's going towards the 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 kernel of the thought or the direction in which he's trying to go theologically. Um, and he's, you'll see the, here that he's throwing uh, Harshav under the bus uh, when he says that par parallelistic style in the Bible consists not of stringing together clauses that bear some semantic, syntactic, or phonetic resemblance. Uh, he's just, he, he's full of it here. Um, Kugel is. Uh, it's if it, it these, those are very important things, um, and they are fundamental. And and uh, uh, he's just trying to emphasize something uh, for the zeitgeist of the time that he's just trying to get across the point here that line B is where the theological cash is. So you know, just forget all the other stuff. It's uh, it's just part of uh, of the game that we all play uh, from time to time. Um, okay, I really appreciated Mark Futado um, and his book I used in class um, when I taught Psalms, and and he he really kind of gets he he gives the three points, and and they can't be emphasized enough. Um, and, and I call this towards a definition of, of Old Testament poetry. So, number one, it's the consistent use of parallelism. Two, terseness of speech. That means that he they're using words very discreetly, and there's only a few of them, two to four words. So it's 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 uh, very few words that are highly selective. Um, and and this is at the very heart of uh, of fundamental operating principles of poetry, its terseness of speech, and then three the high frequency of imagery. So um, parallelism, or, or poetry, excuse me, is going to use similes and metaphor, uh, word pictures. Uh, remember, uh, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. And so, um, you know, it's just like every sermon that a preacher is going to use. He wants to find some type of analogy so that the, the congregation can grasp his, his teaching point if he can find some type of analogy to explain what he's saying. So uh, poetry is just completely filled with uh, imagery in simile and in, in metaphor so and that has its interpretive that that's highly um gosh in poetry it's at the very heart of it and uh and it's very theologically significant um and it's very very useful so he says hebrew poetry is a type of literature that communicates with terse lines employing parallelism and imagery in high frequency Boom. Short and sweet, to the point. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Futado. Okay, another scholar that we need to say something about, Folkelman. Um, 
huge uh, Old Testament scholar, written tons of volumes, um, but I'm not into uh, in, into looking at Hebrew poetry metrically um, or syllabically uh, like he does. Um, but this 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 gentleman deserves uh, to. Uh, be mentioned and he has given his own definition of Hebrew poetry which I, I like a lot um, it says a poem is the result of on the one hand an artistic handling of language style and structure and on the other hand applying prescribed proportions to all levels of the text so that a controlled combination of language and number is created so very very I, I like what he says what he says here and it is to be uh, incorporated within anyone's definition and he's looking I, what I like about it he's looking at the whole uh, not so much just at the fundamental operating <coughs> principles but at the bigger picture that uh, what we're talking on the on the on the not only on the on the dystic level but on the strophic level and the stanzaic level. Um, and, and ultimately the whole poem as a whole. And so he says basically two to four beats uh, or stresses per colon, two to three cola per verse, two to three uh, verses per strophe, or two to uh, three strophes per stanza. And this is typical um, of how a, a, a poem will develop uh, within strophe stanzas. Um, and it begins at the verse level or, or, the, or the colon level. And when he says two to four beats or stresses, that's basically two to four words. Um, <coughs> what that comes out to mean. Um, anyhow, that's very important. Uh, you should be aware of Jan Fokelman's work. Um, and that's excellent. And I, I wanted to put this up. Now, coming to Benjamin Harshav, uh, the Yale prof, he is probably uh, one of the most influential, or not, he is the most influential uh, scholar that, he, he, he's the scholar's scholar. Everyone is derives their, their fundamental operating principles uh, from him. And uh, he hailed from from Yale. Um, he he died uh, a few years back, um, but he is an absolute genius. Um, so he says he uh, Benjamin Harshav argues for a semantic, syntactic, accentual rhythm as the fundamental operating principle of Hebrew prosody. This means uh, that within the verset or half line, there may be an equivalence of meaning that you know meaning of, of words that's semantics or parallelism an equivalent number of stressed syllables that, which are accents or accentuated and lastly a parallel parallelism of syntax these elements are heterogeneously mixed within Hebrew prosody Therefore, in biblical poetry, semantic, syntactic, prosodic, morphological, and phonetic components are mutually reinforcing so that no single constituent, meaning, syntax, or stress, may be considered purely dominant or as purely concomitant. It, the result is a free rhythm, a, ry a rhythm based on a limited uh, and measurable cluster of coordinating and or alternating principles. So his, his this definition is actually genius and it actually gets to uh, right down to the nitty gritty of what's going on behind parallelism. And it has to do with semantic, syntactic, morphological, phonetic components that are oscillating uh, and they're they're mixed heter heterogeneously it's they're not purely dominant or purely concomitant there it's a free rhythm so these things are all happening 
uh, sometimes here, sometimes there, here a little, there a little. Um, but they're all these are the these are the things that are that are behind the screen that are determining what is happening on the line. How it, it, it's it, it it's 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 it all involves the rhythm, and the rhythm is 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 beating according to how these elements are being mixed together uh, in a free rhythm. And um, I guess when some people when they read this they don't understand it, but if you start reading Hebrew poetry on Moss or on Bonk. Um, you'll come to the conclusion when you come back and reread him, you'll understand what he's saying. Um, and he, 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 he is pure genius. And I will, I will at the end of this uh, presentation, give you my own definition of Hebrew poetry. Um, uh, but it is going to, uh, incorporate Harshov's meaning here. And you can see here that, uh, um, when we go back to Kugel, he threw him under the bus because uh, he 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 was he was trying to put him down here for what he was saying, um, and uh, but that was that was that was kind of shady. Um, okay, Harshov. Uh, moving forward in his next work, he says <clears throat> we must make a distinction between the versets, which provide the textual frameworks or vehicles of parallelism and the and the parallels or parallel patterns that fill them a parallel connects two or more terms related to each other by any principle whatsoever accentual syntactic semantic morphological sound patterns etc hence there is a parallelism between two or more versets and several specific parallels that fill them the basic principle of this rhythmical organization is an essential syntactic semantic free rhythm in this order. Uh, this description implies that elements of the three domains uh, provide parallels and each parallel is like free uh, verse in modern poetry with no precise forms. Of these three forces, at least two must appear in every parallelism in poetry. So uh, he's further defining uh, his his principles of Hebrew poetry here, and he has done us a lot of service. And um, the, the, you you can't you can't you you cannot you cannot. Uh, come against anything that this scholar says because whatever he's saying here these are all fundamental features of canonical poetry Th these are the operating principles uh, you know even though kugel wants to say line a is so line b but what's the elements of what how what is line a built upon or what is line b built upon well harshov's telling you the fundamental formal features that 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 how how a line is is written and he's telling you that it's accentual syntactic and semantic all right accentual just means there's there's two to four uh accentuated words per line there are syntactic elements that uh that that are core is syntactic phrases phraseology is what he's trying to say or semantic which just means you know parallelism it's the use of of, of words um parallel words um then there's morphological sound patterns etc that are going to um, come into play um and so so looking here uh very important scholars and the and some of the you know going back we had obviously the the uh, we started with the bishop and and then we're looking at Gray he he's moving the thought forward um, and we're coming to Alter and Kugel that are emphasizing that um, line B is is a it's a it's a pattern of stra it's a strategy of, of intensification line B is where the theological cash is. Uh, Futado's reminding us that it's terseness of speech and it's a high frequency of imagery. 
Um, so that's very important. You want to you want to understand that there's going to be a lot of imagery, a lot of simile, a lot of metaphor um, involved in poetry. Uh, now moving along, along here to another scholar that's uh, he, he's probably all the rage right now. Um, everyone's going to be using his textbook um, here on biblical poetry. Excellent, a absolutely. What it's a genius, and he. What I want to pick out is that. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. He did not throw the bishop under the bus. He he absolutely loves and adores uh, um, the work of um, Robert Loth and, and the contribution that he made, and so he he's not wanting to de denigrate him. He's just wanting to build upon. Uh, what he's already done, and uh, and stand upon his shoulders. He 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 compliments the bishop. So, so I think some some a lot of newer scholars they they want to throw away. They hate the term parallelism, and uh, it, it's it's actually it's beneath them to even mention the word, um, and they want to bury it. Uh, somebody from Toronto uh, said something like that. Hint hint. Um, you can find that out on your own. Um, but let's look here at what uh, Dobbs Allsop, he, he hails from uh, Princeton. Uh, prototypically, the, the line or colon serves as the fulcrum of singularity in biblical poems, especially in parallelism's central line-fixing function. Parallelism, of course, operates on both smaller and larger scales of biblical verse, but it is the single line that is the most that is most often at the heart of this corresponding phenomena, a fact that did not go entirely unnoticed by the biblical poets themselves. The simplest entity relevant, uh, relevant to the, to line grouping in biblical verse is again the single line. So he's just trying to underscore that. When you're looking at at the fundamentals of Hebrew poetry, the line is central, and the half line especially. It, it all begins at line A, and, and and this is where you're going to discover the fundamental formal features of, of Hebrew poetry. So in biblical poetry, the parallelistic couplet is the most commonest form of line grouping. It provides the figural ground or basic texture for most biblical poems. In general, its unity is affected through the contiguity of its component lines and the similarity manifested in the matching play of parallelism and in the rough equivalence of line lengths. Parallelism, as I describe it, is a trope of correspondence or repetition and as such always acts on some singularity as the fulcrum of its play. So here, remember, in correspondence, he's, he mentions this. This all goes back to, again, to back to, to uh, um, Robert Loth. And he said that, it, you know, he said that parallelismus membrorum or parallelism is the correspondence of lines uh, and, or verses. And so everybody, everybody repeats this this terminology of correspondence. It's so central to to uh, to biblical poetry, and poetry in general. Um, and so here for this, the, uh, what I wanted to do in this in this particular slide here is introduce you to Dobbs Allsop. Uh, you should all run out and get his book. Um, it's on Amazon, um, and. He's emphasizing that it is the half line is is where the fulcrum uh, is going to be is going to be focused on, and 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 this is where we're going to see the fundamental features of, of poetry. And he goes on here, and I I wanted to elevate this thought that he has somewhat tucked away in in his book that I want to emphasize and uh, and bring out uh, because this is where I want to go with uh, with poetry um, 
just as the graphic arrangement on the page presents the lines as perceptual units to the eye, the intonation contours heard in the reading of poetry present the lines as perceptual units to the ear. In fact, the main function of the graphic arrangement on the page is to give the reader instructions concerning the intonation contours appropriate to the lines. So, you can look above here. We have Torat Adonai Tamima, line A. And then line B is Meshivat Nafesh. So, the law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. That's line A and line B. And then it's followed up within this quatrain, Edut Adonai Ne'emana Mak Kimat Peti. So here it is. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. Um, so what he's saying here is that when you have these lines, line A and line B, the the when you write down, like here on that we have a three two, both of these are three two three two, and there, I think there's like six lines of these if from verses seven following in Psalm 19 that are going to be written just like this. Um, that you have Torah Adonai Tamima. So you're going to, just because there's three and there's a break, then then the, the, the orator or how this is sung in the temple, the very placement of three words by a pause and then two, followed by two words, the, the intonation and the utterance is going to give the reader instructions concerning how they should pronounce and stress the words. Um, so that's what he's saying by this. Uh, moving on to his next paragraph. Once the technology of writing is invented, the specific metascript conventions for displaying verse structure, such as stichic lineation, that just means line. Stichic is just an, a Greek term for the word line. So um, that's what uh, it's just it's just uh, scholarship here. Okay. Um, so displaying verse structure are elaborated, then they too become available for exploiting uh, prosodically. Various forms of contemporary free verse depend most explicitly on a visual prosody in order to indicate the shape of the line. Of course, as Jay Hollander shows, examples of poems written as much as for the eye as for the ear. So having poetry written out in lines it is just as important you know, it's for the eye is for the ear. So, um, so it's very, very important. So, so it, the, the, he, the, the, this is this is ingenious, and there's more. This is there is more. Th this is uh, this is very important. What he's talking about, and not enough people talk about what he's saying here uh, within biblical studies. Um, sentence logic is one such reason to end the line. It's very common in much oral verse and also for lines to be made up of syntactic holes, complete sentences, clauses, and phrases. In large part, this is in deference to the needs of the perceiving human brain. So cutting up the flow of speech into meaningful chunks, such as phrases, clauses, and the like, is crucial to the comprehension and enjoyment of larger holes in oral verbal art. Indeed, the, the characteristically closed and recursive shape of biblical Hebrew poetic rhythm is itself chiefly a product of end stopping and parallelism. A clausal or sentential whole frame is articulated and then reiterated once or twice over, producing optimally. Um, a halting or pulsing series of progressions, one step forward, 
iteration. And then another step forward, reiteration, and sometimes twice over in the case of triplets and so on. The recursion of parallelism redoubles the syntactic frame and in the process reinforces the projection of wholeness of the stop at line end. Just that whole paragraph, it's meaningful chunks of information. This is what the line is doing. Look at look at this. Torat Adodai Tamima. The law of the Lord is perfect. There's a chunk of information. And it's given to you in lineation. And then there's a pause. And then it says, Meshivat Nafesh. What does the law of the Lord do? It restores the soul. Um... And so these are uh, what 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 is line A? B is more. The law of the Lord is perfect. What's more? How perfect is it? It's perfect in that it it's capable of restoring the soul. Um, so the very very important here um, to understand what um, uh, Dobbs Allsop is saying. This end-stopping, sententious style is the hallmark of oral art forms because it facilitates the easy consumption of whole ideas and because of the paratactic ordering and linear progression of thought that it allows and thus perhaps is one of the surest signs of biblical poetry's deep rootage in and enduring debt to oral performance. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. The end pauses punctuate and thus circumscribe these syntactic holes. Uh, these formulaic phrases, more often than not, prove to be good indicators in poetic line structure and thus help to reveal the reality of that structure. Indeed, the formulas themselves may very well have been precisely in service of performing the poetic line. And in fact, it is parallelism that has most enabled scholars, following Loth, to perceive the line, the verse line, even in those compositions. Um, da, 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 da. So what, what he's saying here is that um, a fundamental formal feature of canonical poetry is the it is it is involved in lineation lines and that the lines are are basically laced they're they're they're, they're ryth rhythmical units of thought that's how i'm going to digest this they they are discrete um uh discrete units of linearized rhythmical thought that's that's how that that's how uh, line A and line B are written. They're written in 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 uh, the linearization of rhythmical thoughts. Um, and, and this is a big, a very very big uh, um, aspect of of Hebrew poetry. <coughs> and Dobbs it nails it here. Um, in, 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 I think, uh, breaking it out for our understanding. Uh, um, moving on here, lastly, we're getting, getting down here to the end of this. Barbara Hernstein Smith, um, everybody loves her, uh, quote here out of her, her textbook on poetic closure. As soon as we perceive that a verbal sequence has a sustained rhythm, that it is formally structured according to a continuously operating principle of organization, we know that we are in the presence of poetry and we respond to it accordingly. We respond to it expecting certain effects from it and not others, granting certain conventions to it and not others. This absolute perfection. Um, and uh, so... When you begin to read Hebrew poetry, you are going to perceive that there is a sustained rhythm, and and 
and and this rhythm is going to then underscore that hey you're no longer reading you know uh this is not narrative this is uh this is operating according to some principle of organization linearly and 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 then so now you're in the presence of poetry and you're going to find that this is a whole the, the size of the new testament that's how much poetry is in the old testament it, it's just literally uh it's awesome so now coming here um to my own definition of hebrew poetry and i i have to I have to uh, give credit here to Dr. Uh, Robert Alter and um, and Edward uh, Greenstein uh, in their assistance in in helping me come to this conclusion. Um, and this is what I have uh, for for myself. Um, I, I am going to tentatively see. Uh, Hebrew poetry for myself uh, according to, to, to the following statement. Uh, the canonical poetry of the Hebrew Bible may be succinctly characterized as distinctive modes of discourse which are communicated and developed by means of discrete units of linearized rhythmical thoughts that typically trade in and oscillate between accentual syntactic and semantic and semantic pr principles, etc., etc. I mean, we can go on to morphological and um, and, and, and and phonetic and, and some other. There's there's more than just these three here, but but these are 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 central to the the the, the fundamental formal features of of um, the operating principles of poetry it's it's, it's accentual syntactic and semantic um, so you can he, you can see Benjamin Harshoff here at the very heart here of what I gotta say so Robert Alter and um, and Benjamin Harshoff uh, and definitely some Dobbs Allsop a little bit going back to um, um, or even from Barbara Hernstein Smith and George Buchanan Gray, I've kind of uh, you know channeled them, uh, so to speak, um, and and put together my own thoughts by 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 looking at what how how they have communicated um, what poetry meant to them, and and so I've I've kind of come down to this, but. Um, but but it's 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 echoing their thoughts, um, in my own words. Uh, that's I guess how, the best way to say it. Um, so, I, every 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 word here, um, you know, as it's it's distinctive modes of discourse. So it's a discourse. It's a it's a whole it it's a whole it's a poem. Okay, it, it has a start and a finish. It's not just one line or two lines, a dissect, trisect. It, it, it has to incorporate the, uh, the 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 thought from the line uh, to the to the strophic level, to the stanzaic level, and ultimately to the complete poem. Um, and so that's and and remember that before that these were written down, these these were all. Uh, the the prophetic oracles the these the these poetic pieces were preached they were preached in the street they were they were they were preached in the, in the gates they they were they were preached at the temple um i mean just re, re, read the book of jeremiah um and you can see how this is operating or 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 isaiah um or or for lyric uh poetry like the psalms they were sung in the in the temple um elegaic uh things were 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 sung over over the dead um in in, in eulogized form um so there's lots of different types of poetry um you can go back to the book of job where 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 you have um you know 
you have dialogue um, and disputations. It's disputation, um, and, and, and you know so. Uh, so there's there's many different genres of poetry. It's not just you know, but 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 uh, when you look at them, they all have some fundamental form, formal feature uh, of operating principle. Um, that you can fit into whatever ca kind of category you want. Um, so, so at, I'll, I'll unpack this later. Um, uh, maybe not right now. Uh, but one thing here is that this discourse or this whole poetic speech, it's being communicated and developed. So this is, I, I want to incorporate the aspect of, of, of what Alter did is that you, you go from 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 line to uh, discourse or from line to to the strophic level um, is that the the discourse is being communicated and developed by means of discrete units of linearized rhythmical thoughts. And and so I'm picking up a lot of uh, Dobbs Allsop there, and and uh, and it's very discreet, or the terseness of speech, uh, as we saw in Mark Futado, um, and uh, <clears throat> and so these are discrete units of linearized rhythmical thoughts, and that these 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 uh, linearized thoughts trade in and oscillate between accentual syntactic and semantic principles um, and that's how th th this is really basically we're getting down to uh, the fundamental principles of Hebrew poetry and, and and there there it is right there and I think that this is a good working definition of of canonical poetry Um, looking here at some of the work of John Hobbins, if you haven't seen his stuff, excellent stuff. He's he's a great scholar. Um, um, he he's just there. There's very few people like him. He he is he's excellent. Um, now I have adapted his whole program. He's going to be basically say two to three prosodic words, um, you know, um, per line. He's going to have two to three die sticks per strophe, two to three uh, strophes per stanza, two to three stanzas uh, per poem. And I'm going to expand that to two to four. All right. Because this is the way when, after reading, re reading all, all of this material for 20, uh, for 20 some years, 30 years, um, it's really, you know, I, I can't, I, I, just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't relegate it to two to three. I'm going to put it at two to four um, because it's going to, it's typically that's what it's going to be. Um, and I'm not, I'm not uh, alone in, in that particular, um, uh, you know, perspective. <clears throat> but anyhow, um, he, he, he's written some of this stuff, so I adapted his his model here um, and so for prosodic words there's typically two to four per verset um, and and then uh, he you know then there's uh, within within beyond the 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 line um, or verset or half line you, you go on to the die stick and then there are typically two to four die sticks per strophe that develop a thought and then uh, there's two to four uh, stanzas or, 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 or strophes that make up a larger unit of thought a stanza um, and this and there's two to four of two to four groups of stanzas that make up a poem um, and so we have to get to you have to get to the the beginning and the end um, you have to look at the big picture, and that's what I appreciated about John Focal, Jan Fokelman was that he looked at this from the whole perspective, uh, it, it, from beginning to end, not just at the fundamental formal features 
uh, of the operating principles. But you got to go beyond that and you got to get to the poem level. So before the poem, within the poem level, we have the verse set or half line, and then you've got either a die stick or a tri stick. You can even have a monocolon. Uh, but beyond that, then you're going to have two to four die sticks that make up a conceptual unit of thought called a strophe. And then you're going to have uh, two to four of these strophes that develop a larger unit of thought called a stanza. And then you could have be, you know, two to four stanzas that make up a complete poem. So each one gonna, is going to be divergent and smaller or bigger uh, in its uh, scope. And you have to take you know, each particular oracle um, on its own. Uh, when you approach it. Um, moving on from here, Watson kind of is delineated uh, the hierarchy of poetics. You've got the poems, stanzas, strophe, verses, slash lines, half lines, versets, prosodic words, syllables, sounds. Uh, a good a good graph of, of understanding uh the whole the whole system of poetry in 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 one little visual uh, slide here. Very good. Okay, so coming here to sum everything up uh, on parallelism vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Robert Alter, <clears throat> and I'm going to give some of a uh, a digested version of what uh, Alter was saying. Uh, with some of my own additions here in, in this slide. <clears throat> the device known as semantic parallelism sets up a colographic system of correspondences where unity and diversity, homogeneity and heterogeneity, thesis and antithesis, parity and disparity, congruence and incongruence are locked up into a dialogical correspondence and conversation of meaning. Herder says that the two parallel members strengthen, heighten, and empower each other. Alter likewise says what this and all the conceptions of biblical parallelism as synonymity assume is a considerable degree of stasis within the poetic line. This stasis anchors the correspondence between the two lines. And the purpose of the second verse set is to have both elements that conjoin and disjoin so that the correspondence of the two parallel members strengthen, heighten, and empower each other by means of both unity and diversity. The perception of diversity in a context of unity is important in parallelism. The purpose of parallelism, like the general purpose of imagery, is to superimpose the visual perception of an object onto the sphere of another so that a new picture emerges, a new form, a new gestalt, which is greater than the sum of its parts. The interpretive nature of parallelism, then, is patently heuristic. Interpretation is left up to the audience to read between the poetic lines in order to fill in the canvas to discern its gestalt, its form, its meaning. This meaning of discovery is entirely intentional by the author on the very basis of poetry's literary nature. Now that, that was... I mean that that was compact um and just there's a lot there there's a lot there to digest um it's worth it going back and and reading that several times um and in it's this is a heuristic um enterprise what i mean heuristics is 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 the art of discovery so what what are you discovering in poetry? You you have when we read poetry, you have to discern what the author was doing with line A and line B. 
How are they related to one another? How is line B connected to line A? And what's the purpose? Does does is it is, is the second one intensifying the thought, or is it is it is it focusing on uh, specificity of some type? Um, there's lots of different things to take into account. It's you have to find out what the correspondence of thought is. So this is why it's it's heuristic. It, it, it's it's the nature of discovery, and it's entirely intentional by the author on the very basis of poetry's literary nature. Okay. Uh, uh, how do we close this thing? Um, thank you for being a part of the very first session of uh, um, Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics. Um, and this is definitely uh, where meaning is context-driven. That's what, that's what this is this this board's going to be about. So if you want uh, some of these slides, um, if you'd like to request them, I can send them to you in uh, in a PDF form. Here's uh, uh, an email address. Uh, all materials are free. This is all uh, educational, um, and uh, I just this is a service to uh, to the believing community. And uh, uh, we don't need to be monetizing this stuff. This is all, it's like the gospel, it's free. So um, if, you, if you'd like some of this stuff, please get back to me. And, this, and all of the material that I put on this platform will uh, follow this suit. All right, well, God bless. And I hope this has been, uh, um, this, this has been a, a, a good first opener. All right, God bless.